good morning to everyone and thank you for uh, joining us today also. Uh, I will present in the uh, fourth session of the conference, late breaking news and uh, selected uh, posters. Uh, will be short presentation, but uh, we will try to have a, a, a break for one or two questions between presentation. Uh, but I will uh, I will limit to just present the, the paper and, and the present, uh, presenting author. Uh, the first paper is molecular co chaperon cysteine uh, uh, styrene protein alpha controls mammal, mammalian targets of mTOR signaling in adult mass fibroblasts. The presenting author is Jose Luis Muñoz Bravo. So, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Jose Luis Muñoz. Um, uh, I'm going to, to present a, a study we have been doing the last uh, year in the lab, so it's still ongoing. But uh, I hope. Uh, So we work with a, a small cochaperon, which is found in the synaptic vesicle. It's a, a, this protein has been well studied in the synaptic vesicle recycling, but um, uh, other um, uh, in other places, is um, not yet uh, very much uh, studied, but uh, in fact, uh, it's a, a, an important uh, protein uh, that uh, protects from neurodegeneration. In fact, mice, mutant mice for CSP, uh, suffer from early death and neurodegeneration, and it's also associated to a <coughs> human disease. It's a, a, a rare disease a neural celloid lipofuscinosis. Some years ago in the lab, uh, some people have, have found that, in fact, outside of this uh, uh, synaptic vesicle, uh, CSP is important for the proliferation of neural stem cells. So we have a, a poster about this outside, if you want to check it out later. So I'm not going to go into the details, but I want you to know that um, uh, CSP is important uh, for the proliferation, and in fact, when CSP is absent from the neurospheres, um, they upregulate uh, mTOR signal pathway, they uh, overproliferate, and all of this can be rescued by rapamycin. So they have shown that, uh, in fact, this is a cell autonomous me mechanism, and we, wonder, we were wondering whether or not uh, this could be a general mechanism, not something specific of this um, cell type. So we decided to get out of the brain to um, to modulate this this pathway and to really study that whether or not this was happening. So we have found that uh, in fact CSP is uh, expressed in almost every single cell type in the body and is um, a specific target to the um, isosomal membrane. is uh, usually found localizing with lysosomal um, uh, markers. And this is important because uh, the lysosome is the place with, where the, the integration of signal uh, for mTOR takes place. So we decided to use uh, embryonic uh, fibroblast because it's the, the cell that uh, the people is usually, uh, usually use that, the cells uh, in the field. So sadly, we couldn't find anything we modulate the, this path with using a growth factor, so, so without the serum and adding insulin, couldn't find anything. But what we found is that um, CSP is upregulated um, in the adult cells. So we repeated the same experiment, and this time we, uh, sorry, so we found that the, uh, it was a uh, perturb, there was uh, a problem in mTOR signaling pathway. So what we found is that, in fact, um, mTOR uh, becomes um, insensitive to starvation. So when we take uh, away the, the, um, the growth factor, um, mTOR signaling pathway is um, switches off, but 
in the absence of CSP that this is not happening. So we think this, this is important. We also check the the, the autophagy because uh, the macrotophagy is under the control of uh, Entor pathway. So in fact, it's, uh, uh, it's blocked by Entor. So we also check this, and um, what we found is, uh, again, with the same kind of experiment, we found that, in fact, um, the autophagy flux is, uh, is blocked. We found that there is no, um, uh, no accumulation of uh, LC3, uh, there is accumulation of uh, P62, uh, over um, uh, phosphorylation of phosphoulk. So, in fact, uh, we believe as a summary, that the CSP is a lysosomal mar uh, marker, and we think that uh, it's probably a, an important protein in the modulation of uh, Entor. And we're now trying to work out the, the molecular mechanism, uh, you know, the interaction, and these kind of things. So, so thank you, to everybody. Do you have any question? Questions? Okay, I have a brief question. Um, because I'm not familiar with CSP alpha, uh, there is any kind of uh, changes uh, that has been previously published uh, in regarding any neurodegenerative disorder? Yeah, I mean, the uh, lipofuscinosis. Uh, some people, um, there's a paper now. In, in Embo, they say it's important for 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 tau um, exocytosis, the kind of thing, and some people say it's uh, associated uh, with uh, Alzheimer, but it's not really well now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next presentation, Lilian is here. Yeah. Ah no, sorry, Alberto. Uh, is from Alberto Parras, and the name of the poster is Alteration of Cytoplasmic Polyadenylation Element Binding Protein in Huntington Disease. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alberto Parras from Jose Lucas Line in Centro de Biología Molecular Severocha in Madrid, and I'm going to talk about alteration of CPVs in Huntington Disease. CPVs uh, means cytoplasmic polyadenylation element binding proteins. CPVs are RNA binding proteins like PA family or FMRP. But CPV consists of four related proteins, CPV1, 2, 3, and 4, that share in structure uh, two RNA recognition motif and one single finger motif. Uh, CPV2, 3, and 4 are closely related. Uh, However, CP, uh, CP1 is the more distant but most studied member of the family. Uh, CPV differs from the other RNA binding protein. The uh, they protein recognizes the CP sequence. It's a consensus sequence in the 3' prime UTR. And CPV uh, control the, the translation by control the cytoplasmic polyadenylation. CPVs uh, act to the two, um, two levels, temporal and local, because CPVs uh, can repress the translation, forming this hairpin, and when get activated by phosphorylation or ubiquitination, uh, they induce the poly, uh, the poly uh, adenylation. And for example, in neurons, uh, CPVs are implicated in the postsynaptic density, where CPVs uh, are implicated in the local translation of many genes in, uh, very important. But why study CPVs in Huntington? Uh, in this paper, published by our collaborator in Barcelona, they identify around 800 mRNAs target of CPV4, and when we, we perform a gene ontology analysis, we found a many genes implicated in Huntington disease. Also, in this paper, they study OR2. OR2 is the ortology of CPV4 in, in Drosophila, and then uh, they found that OR2 is a modifier of CAG toxicity in, in Drosophila. So, we decided to study CPVs in Huntington, 
remember that Huntington is, uh, is, in, is caused by a normal expansion of CAG triplet that encode polycube. And the first question was, are CPVs altering Huntington disease? And we found that CPV4 is decreasing patient, also in two mouse model, uh, knocking on RC1 mice. Uh, however, CPV1 is increasing patient uh, in RC1 mice. But this imbalance CPVs uh, result in a poly -I alteration. And for this, we, we perform a poly -U chromatography. We extract RNA. Uh, from Walta and RC1 my striatum, and then transfer this RNA for a poly U chromatography. We obtain two, two main fractions. The first one, uh, RNA with short poly A tail, and the other one with long poly A tail. Then we identify this, these RNAs. When we compare RC1 my with, with, uh, with Walta, we found that around 2,000 of genes are short, shortened in RC1 mice and other 2,000 are lengthened. And in this slide is the, the main message of my talk because when we, we perform a gene ontology analysis of this gene with poly A changes in RC1 mice, we found uh, many genes implicated in Huntington disease, but in other neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer and Parkinson. So, CPVs, uh, as is evident, that CPVs are implicated in cancer and in chronic liver disease, but this is the first evidence that CPV contributes to ne neurodegeneration. The next question was that does poly A alteration impact at protein levels? And we found that only the, the RNAs with short poly A tail in RC1 mine show a decrease in their protein, not only in RC1 mine, also in patient. However, genes with length poly A tail uh, that, uh, doesn't show any protein changes, for example, syntaxin 6. And the final question is that this uh, alteration of CPVs uh, play a role in the Huntington life phenotype in RC1 mice. Remember that we have two possibilities. The first one, CPV1 uh, increasing RC1 mice. So we, gener uh, we cross the RC1 mice with a knockout, uh, heterozygote knockout mice of CPV1. We restore the normal level of CPV1, but we, we didn't find uh, any changes in, body, in the body weight loss characteristic in RC1 mice, and any improve of rot, uh, motor symptoms in rotor rot on open field, and any changes in, in survival. The other possibility, remember that CPV4 is decreased in, in Huntington disease, and, um, and so we generated a CPV4 uh, overexpression mice. This mice we cross with RC1 mice, and also we, we didn't find any changes in body weight uh, correction on survival. We, we find um, a, a little improvement in motor symptom in rotor rot and open field test. So CPV4 target likely contribute to, to HD pathogenesis. In summary, CPV1 and CPV4 are arteries in Huntington disease, and uh, this, this is imbalance um, impact in a poly A alteration of multiple genes implicated in neurodegeneration. Only poly A shortening leads to decreased protein without changes on mRNAs, and only restoring the CPV4 levels in a mouse model, in a mouse model attenuates the RC1 my phenotype. Finally, uh, I want to thank uh, my boss and all people in my lab, our collaborator in Barcelona, in Los Angeles. And uh, if you have any question or, or comments, in the next coffee break, I will, I will stay in my poster, is the number 38. Thank you. We have also time for one short question. Uh, 
How do you check if there is any change in the hard life of the messenger RNAs that are shorter poly A after? If, if there is any change in the hard life of the messenger RNA with a shorter poly A tail? Que si tiene menor vida media los RNA mensajeros con la cadena de poly A más corta. Uh, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 all we study uh, when uh, RNA have a short poly A tail, uh, they stay in a silent state, and the translation is no no began with the, in this state of silence. The translation is in inhibited, but the, I think. That when we have a short poly A tail, is in is retained, but the, the 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 life is the same. Thank you very much. I presume that you can continue the uh, the talk during the coffee break. Next uh, presentation is Lilian Enriquez Barreto, and the poster name is role of CRT. TC1 in structural synaptic plasticity in the adult brain during the neurodegeneration. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone, and thank you for inviting me uh, to present my work, which is related to the CREP regulator, regulated transcription coactivator 1, CRTC1. And CRTC1 is uh, highly expressed in the brain under basal conditions, it's uh, phosphorylated and located at the cell cytoplasm under synaptic stimulation. CRTC1 is dephosphorylated. It translocates to the nucleus where it activates the transcription of genes related to dendritogenesis, synaptic plasticity, and learning and memory functions. However, the role of uh, CRTC1 in synaptic plasticity, and particularly during neurodegeneration, remains unknown. So our work is aimed to uh, study the role of CRTC1 in, uh, during associative memory, a type of memory uh, which is affected in Alzheimer's disease patients. And we also want to analyze its role in structural synaptic plasticity, and both aims in normal and pathological conditions. Uh, the model that we use is the brain-specific presenilin conditional double knockout mice. It's a model that presents uh, um, pathological uh, features of neurodegeneration occurring in Alzheimer's disease. In our first aim, we uh, wanted to analyze uh, the activation of CRTC1 during associative memory in the hippocampus, a region essential for early context representations. So in here you have the uh, design of the contextual fear conditioning test that we used in this study, and as results indicate, uh, control mice exposed to context plus shock exhibit an increase in the freezing uh, responses at 2 and 24 hours after training. And as expected, phosphorylated levels of CREP are increased after context and context plus shock. But interestingly, the phosphorylated levels of CRTC1 are decreased at 15 minutes and 2 hours after training. And these decreased levels in CRTC1 dephosphorylation indicate CRTC1 activation. So we can say that CRTC1 is specifically dephosphorylated in the hippocampus during associative memory. To analyze if this uh, activation of CRTC1 induces CRTC1 nuclear translocation during associative memory, we decided to uh, study the um, spatiotemporal pattern of CRTC1 activation in different brain, brain regions as, uh, related to associative memory, including the hippocampal circuit. Uh, so in this uh, case, uh, we use six-month-old wild-type mice submitted to the CFC test, but in this case, the animals were sacrificed immediately at 5, 15, 30 minutes, and one hour after training. The naive mice remain in their home cages without receiving the, the training. Analysis of the neuronal population 
in different brain areas indicate that CRTC1 is rapidly and transiently activated during associative memory, translocating to the nucleus in a time-dependent manner. And this nuclear translocation was more pronounced in CA3, while it was modest in CA1, the basolateral amygdala, and the entorenal cortex. A more detailed study to analyze the degree of, trans of, of translocation in individual neurons in a given region, uh, we uh, found that activated neurons exhibit different degree of CRTC1 nuclear content. And as an example, this graph represents the population of neurons presenting the highest degree of translocation in the region of CA3 a long time. So we can also say that CA3 seems to have an essential role in uh, associative memory encoding. So CRTC1 co-localizes uh, to MAP2 with MAP2 in the dendrites of CA3 hippocampal neurons in naive conditions. But 15 minutes after contextual fear conditioning, this co-localization is significantly reduced. Furthermore, context associative learning, but not context or shock, exhibit, uh, uh, um, induces a high nuclear translocation of CRTC1. Uh, so we can suggest that CRTC1 is essential for uh, associative memory encoding, and we hypothesize that um, CRTC1 activation and nuclear translocation may be altered in neurological disorders occurring with cognitive deficits. In this sense, we have demonstrated that double knockout mice for presenilin present a significant reduction in CRTC1 nuclear translocation due, uh, after contextual fear conditioning, which is in accordance with the memory deficits observed in these mice. Interesting, interestingly, uh, CRTC1, act, uh, I'm sorry, contextual fear conditioning also induces the transcription of CREP target genes. And after CRTC1 overexpression in the hippocampus, the time freezing responses 24 hours after training were increased both in the wild types and in the double knockout mice, thus suggesting a memory enhancing effect. And CRTC1 overexpression also induces uh, an increase in the transcription levels of CREP target genes, but only in the double knockout mice. For the second aim of our study, we have to bear in mind that dendritic spines are structural correlates of learning and memory processes. So we uh, decided to analyze the number and morphology of dendritic spines in uh, Ba uh, basal dendrites of pyramidal neurons in CA1 and CA3. And we found that double knockout mice have a significant decrease in the number of dendritic spines, both in CA1 and similarly in CA3, compared to the wild types. CRTC1 overexpression doesn't increase the number of dendritic spines, neither in the wild type nor in the knockout. Morphological characterization of dendritic spines demonstrate that remaining spines in the double knockout mice are dysmorphic, exhibiting enlarged head areas and elongated necks, suggesting synaptic scaling to compensate synapse loss. CRTC1 overexpression in the hippocampus differentially regulates dendritic spines morphology depending on physiological or pathological conditions. This is, it uh, increases the spine head area and it produces an increase in the length of the neck in the wild type animals, while in the double knockouts, it decreases the length of the neck. Uh, the study of the CRTC1 overexpression in uh, morphological alteration in specific spine subtypes also suggests that CRTC1 differentially affects the geometry of specific spine subtypes. So we can hypothesize that CRTC1 dependent structural modifications could enhance synaptic transmissions. 
So two main conclusions from this work are that CRTC1 is a useful indicator of synaptic neuronal activity and it's crucial for associative memory encoding. And that CRTC1 regulates differentially structural synaptic plasticity in physiological or pathological conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? I have a curiosity. Uh, do you choose um, the you choice the presenting one knockout mice as a neurogenerative uh, model, model? But there is any kind of relationship between um, uh, the protein and uh, any kind of partners with presenting one with gamma securities complex? Um, but what if exactly? Any, you mean? any any protein related uh, with with presenilin that could be it can be a, a uh, in the mechanism exactly. Uh, well, we are now actually uh, starting to analyze all these uh, uh, CRTC1 molecular mechanism implicated. So we are evaluating different possibilities, but we don't know because it's just a project that is okay. starting. So cannot say anything. Thank you very much. So next poster is from Cavio, Fabio Cavaliere. Uh, Astrocyte contribute to the spreading of pathogenic alpha synuclein. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for selecting our poster story. Uh, during this short communication, we, I, I would like to convince you that astrocytes contribute to the spreading of and, and pathology of uh, alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease. So, as you well know, Parkinson's disease is characterized by Lewy body's inclusion. Uh, which main component is uh, alpha synuclein uh, protofibrils? Uh, fibrils, sorry. Uh, alpha synuclein fibrils is toxic to the neurons and can be spread and transported to other cells uh, in a prion like uh, mechanisms, inducing the neuronal death directly or indirectly through activation of neuroinflammation. The principal aim of, of this work uh, is to study the, the role of astrocytes in alpha synuclein spreading, as already stated. And the, this, this communication will be divided in two parts. In the first part, part I, I will show the, the mechanisms of alpha synuclein inclusion. And then I will try to, uh, and, 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 then, and then I will. Uh, demonstrate how alpha synuclein can be transported from cell to cells. All these experiments were performed uh, by our student, uh, PhD student, Paolo Ramos, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Dehe and Professor Bezard from University of, of Bordeaux. We used uh, Lewy body extract from PD patients and, treated, and we treated uh, rat neurons or astrocyte cultures uh, to study uh, alpha synuclein in uh, incorporation. Uh, to do this, we used a specific antibody against the human protein. You can see uh, in, as, as a red dot in the, in the immunofluorescence. As you can see, alpha synuclein can be exogenous, alpha synuclein can be incorporated into uh, neurons and astrocytes, and with, with a major extent, uh, in the in the astrocytes, as demonstrated by uh, ELISA assay of uh, cytoplasmic uh, uh, fractions, exogenous alpha synuclein can be incorporated uh, by phagocytosis, and uh, as you as you can see by the colocalization of uh, alpha synuclein with. Uh, and um, early endosome marker coupled with GFP, and can be also uh, colocalized into into lysosome, um, uh, both in neurons and uh, and, and astrocytes. Moreover, uh, exogenous alpha synuclein, uh, when incorporated into the the cells, uh, can activate endogenous alpha synuclein, as demonstrated by Western blot with the specific antibody against uh, rat. Uh, rat alpha synuclein. And as you can see from the uh, quantification analysis, especially neurons uh, overactivate the endogenous alpha synuclein. So, in the second part, 
uh, we want to demonstrate that alpha synuclein can be transported to uh, other cell types, from cell to cells. Uh, to do this, we used uh, microfluidic chambers in which we seed uh, to, you can see two different uh, cell populations, which are in contact only by microgroups. Uh, basically, you you incorporate, you incubate uh, donor cells, let's say, in with alpha synuclein, and then you check with a specific human antibody the alpha synuclein to the other uh, cell type. Passive transportation of, of alpha synuclein is avoided by increasing the, the, the volume of receptor chambers. So as you can see, uh, alpha synuclein, exogenous alpha synuclein can be transported from astrocytes to neurons, from neurons to astrocytes, uh, and from neurons to neurons and astrocytes to astrocytes. Um, moreover, uh, we observed that when we when we in, incubated uh, astrocytes with exogenous alpha, with human alpha synuclein, we observed in the in the other part of, of the microfluidic chamber uh, neuronal apoptosis, indicating that uh, alpha synuclein transported from astrocytes can be toxic to to neurons. So finally, we can design this our conclusion in which. Um, exogenous alpha synuclein can be uh, incorporated into uh, astrocytes. Uh, astrocytes can transport uh, alpha synuclein to neurons, with, which uh, overexpress endogenous, also endogenous alpha synuclein, and inducing apoptotic, uh, apoptotic pathway. So if you have any concern or if you want to discuss with me this, this this data, uh, we are post. We are in front of the poster number ten. Time for questions. Okay, I have a curiosity. Uh, do you show that um, uh, with all this kind of transport uh, between uh, different uh, cells? Um, become toxic for neurons after the uh, intercommunication with uh, with astrocyte. Do you think that uh, a direct uptake by neurons is not as toxic as if the uh, alpha synucleins arrive uh, from uh, astrocytes? There is something related with this kind of transport that made more toxic. We, we were, I mean, uh, um, neurons are more sensitive to to alpha synuclein, of course, and. There is also uh, one paper demonstrating in vivo that uh, incorporation of, of alpha synuclein into astrocytes is related with more uh, neuronal death. Um, this, I mean, this project is devoted also to, to study the mechanism by which astrocytes can kill uh, neurons. So uh, I would like to, to demonstrate uh, how alpha synuclein, I mean, we, which kind of alpha synuclein is incorporated into the astrocytes and then the mechanism by which uh, neuronal, uh, neurons are dead. So at the moment I, can, I cannot answer the, this question, but we are in this. Thank you for asking the comments. Thank you. I have actually two questions. First, you have an idea of the mechanism why this aggregated synuclein increase the expression of the rat synuclein? No, no. At the moment, we have no... Because I don't know that anybody has reported No, this. I mean, this is just descriptive at the moment. Uh, and the other question is, okay, uh, there is no surprise that you had two cells, either astrocytes or neurons, and they get closer, they get contact. So have you any other protein that are not transported from the astrocyte to the neurons or from the neurons to the astrocyte to check that this is specific for synuclein? No, we, we didn't check. We didn't check any I mean, other proteins, but... Unusual for synuclein or is just a common pathway I mean, there is many already other proteins share with synuclein? It, it is already dem demonstrated that alpha synuclein can be transported, no? But, I mean, I think the... The new thing of this this work is that astrocytes actually is directly involved in uh, in synuclein. Yeah, this are a recent report on um, microtunnels responsible yeah. of the transport, like prion proteins. So that's why I'm asking you if there is any other protein you have checked 
it they move also through both. No, we, sides. we didn't check. Okay, I mean, uh, for the specificity, I can say that uh, alpha synuclein is not incorporated, for example, in, in oligodendrocytes. I mean, uh, we have that's, only this evidence. No, that that's is curious, actually, because oligodendrocytes, you know, express synuclein by yeah, itself. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, again. Next, ports, next poster is from Maria Jorens Martin. And the name of the, t the title of the talk is Acute Stress Sabotage, the Synaptic and Morphological Maduration of Newborn Granule uh, Neurons and Triggers a Unique uh, Pro-Inflammatory Environment in the Hippocampus. Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee for having selected our poster for a short presentation and also for giving me the opportunity to share the work we do in Jesus Avila's lab at the Center for Molecular Biology um, in Madrid to share this work with all of you. And of course, many thanks to all of you for your attention. Um, as you all may know, the main research topic addressed by Jesus lab is Alzheimer's disease. This is the most common cause of dementia among older adults. And um, as you also may know, uh, the neuropathological changes observed in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients have been extensively studied in the CA3 and in the CA1 hippocampal subfields, given that this, uh, this area suffered the most dramatic cell losses during the advance of the disease. However, uh, several years ago, we demonstrated that the granule neurons of the dentate gyrus also uh, experience a profound morphological transformation during the advance of the disease. In this representative image of the human dentate gyrus, you can observe how a typical granule neuron from a control subject uh, displays uh, just one single uh, primary apical dendrite emerging from the soma and acquires a, a Y shape. This is the normal phenotype of these neurons in human. Uh, but in contrast, granule neurons from Alzheimer's disease patients display several primary apical dendrites emerging from the soma, um, that's, that's acquiring a B-shaped phenotype. And growing evidence suggests that this is an aberrant phenotype of these neurons, given that a similar morphology of these cells has been uh, demonstrated to occur under several uh, pathological circumstances, such as inflammation, epilepsy, and schizophrenia, and of course, in many other um, animal models of, the, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are several risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's disease that we have learned these days. AIDS, of course, is the, the best known risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease. And also genetic factors and those related, related to lifestyle play also an important role. And among different factors, uh, stress maybe is one of the most important factors related to life, lifestyle that can, that can help to develop Alzheimer's disease. In this regard, it is known that stress um, activates several mechanisms that finally lead to, to the development of depression and also to inflammation. And also there is some, a lot of data that demonstrates a strong link between depression, inflammation, and dementia. So given the indirect association between stress and Alzheimer's disease, we aimed at studying the effects that a single episode of uh, acute stress could have on different aspects of hippocampal functioning. And we, in this study, we focused our attention on two, two populations that are critical for the correct functioning of the, of the hippocampal formation, that are the newborn granule neurons and the microglial cells. So in order to better understand how acute stress could affect uh, newborn granule neurons, we first selected a well-known model of acute stress that is the fourth swimming test or the porcel test. During this test, as you all may know, uh, the animals are, in, are placed in a cylinder filled with water and for six minutes during two consecutive days. As you can see, during the first day, the animals uh, remain swimming most of the time. They are trying to escape from a very stressful situation. This is the first day of the test. However, during the second day, the animals show signs of behavioral despair and they remain mostly immobile. 
So what is already known, uh, this acute stress protocol triggers an increase in the levels of circulating corticosterone that is transient. We demonstrated that this occurs just immediately after the conclusion of the test, but this appears 24 hours later. And also, we demonstrated that acute stress increases the levels of, of interleukin-6, that is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, very important for the development of major depression in patients. So, First, in order to study the alterations in the newborn granule neurons triggered by acute stress, we used a GFP-expressing retrovirus that we injected in the hippocampus of wild mice, and eight weeks later we subjected the animals to the porcel test and then sacrificed them. First thing we did was to analyze the morphology of these newborn granule neurons, and as you can observe, interestingly, acute stress triggered the appearance of the same B shape of the granule neurons. And also, it triggered the disappearance of the distal branching of the dendrites, as is reflected by the Schultz analysis. In addition, in collaboration with Professor Carlos Lois, we used a PSD95 GFP expressing retrovirus to study the alterations that acute stress triggered on the connectivity of these newborn granule neurons. And importantly, we found that acute stress drastically reduced the number of postsynaptic densities in these neurons. So uh, we could conclude that acute stress dramatically altered the functionality and the morphology of newborn granule neurons. But in the light of the increase in the levels of interleukin-6, we questioned whether this protocol could also trigger the activation of the microglial cells in the dentate gyrus. And first, we quantified the number of microglial cells, and we found that acute stress triggered a significant increase in the number of this population of cells. And also, it drastically changed their morphology. They, it, it made uh, microglial cells much more ramified, which could indicate the, their functional activation. But we wanted to further confirm this functional activation, and we quantified the expression of the marker of microglial activation that is known as CD68, finding a significant increase in, in, in the expression of this marker in microglial cells, thus suggesting that um, actually acute stress triggered the activation of microglial, microglial cells. But we wanted to further characterize the inflammatory phenotype, or the inflammatory environment in which newborn, neuro, gra, newborn granule neurons were growing. And we performed a 96 cytokine protein array in hippocampal tissue of naive and stressed animals. And in order to make a long story short, uh, let's say that acute stress changed the levels of expression of 23 molecules. And what, is, what was more interesting for us was that not only pro-inflammatory, but also anti-inflammatory cytokines and growth factors changed their levels of expression after acute stress. So, we, conclude that, uh, we concluded that uh, the phenotype of this environment um, composed by microglial cells, astrocytes, endothelial cells, and also neurons was changed in a very particular manner after acute stress, given that not only the, pro the classical pro-inflammatory molecules such as TNF or interleukin-1 beta, but also um, interleukin-10 and survival factors, all this environment was changed. And it is possible to hypothesize that the chronic maintenance of these alterations could lead to a dramatic alteration of hippocampal functioning. However, further studies are needed to, to determine if this these alterations could be related to the development of Alzheimer's disease or not. And just to finish, I would like to introduce you the group in which this work has been performed. This is, this is an old picture, but <laughs> mostly this is Jesus Avila's lab at the Center for Molecular Biology in Madrid. And I would like to thank all those who made this work possible, especially Jerónimo Jurado, Marta Bolos, who is also in the audience, and Noemi Payas, and of course uh, Esther Garcia, who is not here, for their help with experiments. And of course, I would like to thank Jesus for his supervision, supervision and, and support. I would like to thank our collaborators and, of course, our sponsors, especially the Alzheimer's Association, who has awarded me a new investigator research grant to develop a part of this project. And of course, many thanks to all of you for your attention. Questions? Uh, Maria, uh, what is the uh, functional meaning of 
the the neurons. I mean, are, are they more committed to to die or more committed to differentiate? Actually, um, actually, we don't know which are the, the the final functional differences between these these two types of cells. We are now collaborating with other people who are trying to make electrophysiological recordings of these cells, and they are the expert, and they they expect to find differences, but. Honestly, we still don't know. Um, we can hypothesize that an increased branching of the cells in the proximal domain of the cell, it means a higher activation probably from the inhibitory local circuit and less activation from the, from the perforant pathway. But this is something that still has to be demonstrated. Anyway, it's an index of stress. No? Sorry? It's, it's a stress index, no? I mean, it's a stress marker. Yeah, I, it's, yeah we, we comment about this many times in the lab because um, any damage you induce to these neurons, you probably will observe the same phenotype. So we have observed with inflammation alone, with GSK3, with overexpression of pathogenic forms of tau, and other people with, um, with seizures. So it's like a, maybe it's like a response mechanism to, to the damage, to any kind of damage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Ah. Uh, so I'm wondering about the, the relation between the microglia uh, activation or morphological change and the uh, newborn granule neurons uh, changes. So is there any direct uh, relationship? So maybe these um, changes in microglia then triggers changes in, in, in the born new neurons? Yeah, of course it could be, and if you just activate microglia with LPS, you observe a similar phenotype in the neurons. But um, if you mean by a direct interaction, you mean like um, pruning, of syn synaptic pruning or something like that, it could be for, for synapses. But for me, it's more difficult to imagine how a remodeling of the cytoskeleton could be played by microglia. So, I think maybe, yeah, maybe synaptic pruning goes first and then the cytoskeleton is remodeled, but who knows? So only with inflammation you observe the same changes, but direct or not direct, it's... So uh, do you think we, this will happen or if, or have you ever studied chronic stress on this, and would you expect to revert, you know, this phenotype after a while, only from an acute stressor, or, you know, can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think the, the first who studied the, the effects of stress on, on the morphology of hippocampal neurons in general, they were Bruce McEwen and Elizabeth Gould in the 70s, and they used chronic stress. They, they didn't demonstrate for the newborn granule neurons because they, they couldn't use retroviruses, but they demonstrate for the general population of granule neurons. And, um, what, what was most surprising for us was the fact that just a single episode of acute stress could trigger the same, the same alterations that they observed in the chronic, in the chronic model. Um, we didn't study anything about the recovery after stress, but we did in the case of uh, inflammation, we did many combinations of um, treatments of LPS and different recovery periods, and we found that morphology is easily recovery pull <laughs> can be easily recovered, but not the synaptic alterations. Not only those of the dendritic spines, but also those on the mossy fiber terminals, they, they cannot be recovered so easily. So it seems that morphology is something that can adapt, can be adapted more easily and more rapidly, but maybe synaptic alterations are, and there's a lot of studies about the effects of stress during pregnancy and also perina perinatal period demonstrating uh, long-term alterations in, in connectivity. I'm not sure about the morphology, but in connectivity they are for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much again. Now we move to Two presentations related with uh, Rielin. The first one will be uh, from Tony Del Rio. 
The title of the poster is Reading Expression in Kreufel Jacob Disease an Experimental Model of Transmissible Spongy for Encephalopathy. Vale, vale, okay. Okay. okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Javier. Um, our lab is, um, is working soon. Our lab is working at the Institute of Engineering in Catalonia, which is located in the Science Park of Barcelona. And actually, we are developing several projects in neurodegeneration, some of them related with the analysis of the neurofibrillary degeneration using APSLs, and also uh, in correlation with some of the previously presented data, some experiments, yes, so projects dealing about the alpha synuclein spreading by using in vivo models as well as in Lapanachi devices. So, but today I would like to mention as a key word of our poster number 13, which as, as you can see here is related with real expression in, in cross jacob diseases and, and models of encephalopathy. So, as you, as you can see in the, in, the, in the title, here there are two partners or two main actors. The first one is PRPC. PRPC is uh, the normal prion protein or the cellular prion protein, which is a 254 long uh, amino acid long uh, protein, it's a GPY anchor protein, uh, they, they contain three domains, the cellular, the C-terminal domain, which is a globular domain, the middle domain, which is a flexible one, and the N-terminal, which is a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a domain that uh, has the capability to bind copper. Uh, our lab uh, developed several studies uh, using and um, focusing the, on the role of this uh, protein, and we collaborate in several articles just describing the neuroprotective function of the protein. So. However, most of you know this protein because the conversion from the cellular prion protein to pathogenic one is uh, associated with the development of the uh, Kersiakov diseases and several pranopathies. In fact, this uh, abnormal protein can, um, can accumulate it in the brain of the, of the patients uh, leading to their neurodegeneration. So the second main actor here is Rillin. Rillin is a huge protein. It's a 420, it's a 420 kilodaltons protein. It's a extracellular one, which is expressed in the adult by gabaritin the neurons in the neocortex and can be protolyzed by several enzymes in order to give several fragments. And in this, uh, in this presentation, you will see that you will, in the most of the presentation the slices, there are three, three bands, 400, uh, 420, 310, and 180 in cell extra that's um, mouse brain and human brain deliver samples. Because we use an antibody that recognizes the N-terminal domain, which is located here by Asteris, which is a 142 antibody. So what about the, the interest of, whoa, it's working? Yeah. What about the interest of Rillin? <clears throat> the interest of Rillin becomes because uh, this, uh, this, this protein can uh, bind to two different uh, receptors, lipoprotein receptors, and uh, after the activation of the adapter protein, which is uh, that one, is able to modulate synaptic plasticity, neurite grow, and dendrite, uh, dendrite spine development. So most of the function and decline, it strongly declined in neurodegeneration, and many studies analyze the the levels of expression of drilling in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, there are two main uh, ideas. The first one is uh, that drilling is, uh, is decreased in Alzheimer's, and the second one is that the drilling is increased in Alzheimer's. So, nevertheless, this, uh, these two ob observations, what we know is that drilling is, 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 uh, is a good protein for Alzheimer's disease because in transgenic double mice is able to rescue <coughs> the expression of drilling, the cognitive deficit. But in, in, uh, in, in the second point, we know that in uh, so Javier's uh, such a lot of groups and nicely describe it, that this really in the, in the, in the Alzheimer's is a non-functional protein. So, but nothing about Kersiakov disease. So, I mean, in, the, in our study, we look at the really levels in the mouse model of prion infection. We also look at the levels in Kersiakov disease sporadic patients. And later on, we make some experiments in order to understand the, the changes that we'll show you in vitro by using human prion peptides. So, as, you, as I mentioned, there is a change from the normal to pathogenic one. So the levels of the normal are decreasing in the cancer Jacob diseases. So in the next experiment, what we want to know is that if changes in the prion protein 
and the solar one, the good one, also uh, trigger changes in the, in, the, in the endogenous levels of drilling. For that reason, we use uh, several mice with from knockout and the overexpressing one by using several techniques or uh, Wesser plot, immuno, and RT PCR. We, de we were unable to, to observe any change on drilling related with the changes in the expression of the PRPC. Okay? The next one, uh, we move to the mouse model of pure infection. And this was a really difficult to understand because independent of the kind of inocula, we observe that there is a decrease in drilling levels. But uh, this do not correlate with changes in the neural population. So we were, we were very scared with this kind of results. And we forced it to move to an, another model, which is a transgenic mice 340. I will go more in detail of this. This mice is a knockout mice. They don't express a mouse uh, uh, PRP protein, but it's, uh, it's, it overexpresses the human form of the prion protein. So after inoculation with human derived tissue, we observe that a strong prion deposition in the neocortex of these mice with less deposition in the, in the cerebellum, which is in something that is more associated with the type 1 sporadic disease. That is disease. It's considered a good model. In collaboration with several labs, we were able to demonstrate that the neocortex, after 180 uh, days post inoculum, there is an increase of drilling by RT-PCR. However, in the cerebellum that do not, that do not present a strong uh, deposit of PRP, there is no changes in drilling. So, well, let's move to the patients. And in this was very, uh, <laughs> really difficult because, you know, it's a, it's a solar protein and this is very dangerous material, very infective material. As with collaboration, with the collaboration of Isidra, we were able to use 26 patients of this, uh, of, uh, with uh, sporadic Krasiakov disease for Western protein and 10 additional 10 for uh, RT-PCR. So, uh, in this well characterized uh, um, patients, we observe that there is a tendency of increase of uh, reeling levels in the neocortex as by Western blood or where with uh, RT PCR. So, okay, reeling increase in more human models of the disease, but um, what happens with the signaling of this protein? It's quite difficult to work with human prions, as you can imagine. So we were able to uh, change that a little bit in order to use human derived, uh, peptides derived from the human sequence. That in several experiments, we observed that it's more or less similar to the activation triggered by prions. In those experiments, what we did is to use uh, this human derived peptides, and we observed that one day, after in, in vitro, in primary cultures, inoculation, there is an increase of relief. This also happened as, as four days, but there is no changes in the levels of half-oil receptors or two and the overall receptor. So, but we, we aim to analyze what happens with that one, because that one is a direct target of uh, in normal development in the adult. So what we observe is that we, we can divide the, this interaction in two phases. The first one, after, the after the incubation, we observe, well, this is quite difficult to move on. So we observe a relevant increase of that one phosphorylation, but we don't, we're, we're, we're unable to see an increase of brilliant. And in the second phase, the opposite way. We observed increase of brilliant in one day or four days after the incubation, but we were unable to see any DAP1 phosphorylation. So something happens here. So, I mean, in summary, this 30 minutes, there is increase of that one. It that seems that it's not related with brilliant levels. And in one, after one day, there is an increase of brilliant that do not correlate with that one phosphorylation. So, we, we next move to check this, what happened with this, and with the help of Eduardo Soriano, that gives us the really knockout mice, the natural knockout mice for reading. We prepare primary cultures and we incubate with the peptides, and we observe that there is an increase of that one phosphorylation in these mice, in the absence of reading. So this seems very clear that this that one phosphorylation do not correlate with the level of reading, and reading doesn't play a role here. But what happened with the second? In the second, what we did is to try to determine why this, level, this increased level of reeling. And for that, we analyzed the interaction of these peptides and prion, uh, pathogenic prions with uh, membranes, with cell membranes. We observed by using uh, atomic force microscopy that this interaction <coughs> makes the membrane more fluid. I don't want to go into details, but it's more fluid. They generate some holes, and these changes at the membrane in the cell increase extracellular kinases. Uh, ARC-1-2, uh, ARC P38, etc. So there is an increase in the kinase activity of some of some extracellular related kinase and MAP kinases, and this correlates with an increase of reactive phosphorus species after the prion infection. So this can be observed by using the ethereum, this fluorescent proof, and there is an increase of the 
fluorescent cells by activation of the, of the ROS generation by this prion. But more relevantly, if we use ROS scavenger like NAC or DPY, which is a blocker of NOx, this activation is abolished. They decrease. So what happens with relin? What we did is to incubate a primary culture with these peptides in presence of NAC of DPY. And we observe that this increase after one day, uh, four days, I only put here the, the one day experiment, this increase of relin is blocked by the addition of NAC and DPY. So in conclusion, what we observe is that relin levels increase in calcium of diseases and T340 uh, infected mice. This fact that one phosphorylation is not associated with lean, and late relin changes do not correlate with this one phosphorylation, which seems to be in the point of the Haber uh, <laughs> studies that maybe this relin is not functional. And more relevantly, ROS generation is the responsible of the increase in relin that happens in our culture. So, to finish, I would like to thank the people, which is <laughs> the people that normally do these experiments, all the funding and the association, and of course the help of Cybernet. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Questions? I say three now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, is uh, we observe it uh, that we have not a uh, correlation between real changes and, re and changes in the other protein related with the signal in cascade. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, you found increase in phosphorylation of DAP1. Uh, do you have any, any idea about uh, which, is, uh, which protein is triggering this uh, increase in phosphorylation? Is an autophosphorylation related with some of the change in the memory? We <coughs> In the oh sorry, in the experiments of we use by using IFM, we this this experiments what we prepare. I, I will focus. Huh? I don't go away. So these experiments are prepared using a membrane, synthetic membranes by using phosphatidylcholine and cholesterol. So it is a, the idea to mimic, which is the lipid graph activation of movement after the prion incubation. So. This, uh, this, uh, this data indicates that these uh, membranes in the presence of cholesterol are more flexible and more diffusible. So what happens in this? That uh, there is some kinases that are associated with this, and one of them is a uh, thin kinase. Is, uh, we consider, uh, yeah, we have several data, that uh, fin kinases, fin kinases and sar kinases are the responsible of the, of the activation of that one in the absence of relief. I think it's not police, but, uh, but the point is what happens in the late? <laughs> With the, the ROS is blocking, okay, but uh, what happens later on? So, I mean, we are now looking at the metalloproteinases, whether the fragments are different, whether the mobility is different, and then in order to understand what happened with this, that's, uh, that's the point, but they were surprising. But it seems that, uh, as I mentioned, that this protein, in the, at least in the case of Kyrgyzstan uh, disease, the increase is not functional. That also may help the process of the neurodegenerative uh, in, that you can see in these in these in these patients. We'll see. We'll see. More questions? Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Next presentation is from Immaculada Cuchillo Ibáñez, and the title of the presentation is uh, "Vitamiloid Compromised Relin Signaling in Alzheimer's Disease." Thank you. Well, good morning. This is another talk about relin, but uh, in Alzheimer's disease and related to beta amyloid. Relin is a very well-known protein that has many func different functions along brain development. So it has functions during the prenatal brain and also in the postnatal brain and adult brain, which is our focus. Relin is involved in dendrite maturation, cytogenesis, cellulite transmission and plasticity, and also in LCP in hippocampus. So that's why it's related to memory and learning. Um, when, well, relin is a, is a protein that is secreted. It's a glycoprotein has at least 18 sites of, of glycosylation and it forms dimers before binding to the receptor. The main receptor in the central nervous system is the EPOER2. So relin uh, binds to the, as dimers to the receptor and it initiates the signaling cascade. And the first step is the phosphorylation of that one, the, the adapter protein, that one. And this 
This mechanism is common for all the signaling transductions of relin is involved. So from this point, relin is able to control tau phosphorylation by sk 3 beta or the kinesis. This is a very simple scheme. <laughs> And it's also able to activate in NMDA receptors and also protein transduction, uh, transcription in the nucleus. It can be by ERK12 protein, but also uh, we have described that, that it can be uh, controlled by a small fragments called ICD, the, the intercellular domains of APOER2. These are generated by secretases after relin binds to the receptor. And we have described that this ICD uh, fragment is able to control relin uh, transcription. So there is an auto control of the, of the signaling. We have been working in the limb for some years and we have the hypothesis that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, relin is forming bigger complexes than, than dimers. And also we think that the glycosylation of relin is different from control, from control uh, uh, samples. So all this together is making relin unable to start the signaling cascade, affecting all the signaling cascade. And uh, we have seen also increasing uh, tau phosphorylation. We now are measuring the levels of relin in, in, con in frontal cortex of Alzheimer patients. And what we have seen is that relin is increased in, in Alzheimer in soluble fractions and also in the insoluble relin, which is in the pellet and was solubilized, solubilized with vanidine. As you can see here, is specifically at late black stages where we can find this higher level of relin. This, uh, this stage corresponds when the moment when the tangles reach a higher areas of the neocortex at the frontal cortex, and this is our case, uh, occipital and parietal neocortex. We measure also by, we did quantitative, quantitative assays at the ELISA, and, this, and we have the same results. We have more relin in Alzheimer's disease. And also the expression of the mRNA relin is higher in, in Alzheimer than in control. And again, in, at these late black stages. Also, uh, we found that relin from human, cortel, uh, from human cortex is able to interact with A beta. In these experiments, in this uh, immunoprecipitation assays, we can see that relin is able to co-precipitate A beta, and A beta is also able to co-precipitate uh, relin. And this happened in control and in Alzheimer's uh, samples. In cells, uh, when you, we treat cells, in this case, differentiated SUSE cells with A beta, we observe that A beta also increases levels of the cytosolic uh, relin. And therefore, we have less relin secreted to the media. And A-beta uh, is able, again, to increase the expression of the messenger of relin. So this is, uh, we have similar results from, to Alzheimer's. Sorry. Um, again, relin, we found relin, and uh, not interacting because this is not a uh, precipitation uh, experiment, but we found relin and A-beta together in the insoluble fraction of the media, so in the pellets. So now we, I think we are very sure that we have the, the, there is more relin in Alzheimer's cortex, but we wonder how is the signaling cascade. And to do this, we use two different antibodies, again, phosphodap, and specific phosphodap one antibody and the phosphotyrosine. And with both antibodies, we saw that there is a reduction in on the phosphorylation of that one. So therefore, there is a disruption and the initiation of the signaling cascade of relin. And another key process of relin signaling is the processing of the APOER2 uh, receptor. And I told you before, when relin binds to the receptor, it starts the processing, uh, the receptor is internalized, and the secretases uh, process the, the receptor and generates fragments. One very well known fragment is the CTF, and as well the ICD I come in before. But we have identified another fragment, which is an extracellular and soluble fragment uh, of around 70 kilodaltons. To identify this fragment, we use the antibody 1.186, which is specific for the ectodomine of the APOER2. And uh, this fragment appears more robustly when we apply drilling to the media of the cells. We also have samples of uh, cerebrospinal fluid of SIPs and driller SIPs. Uh, this driller has a mutation in the DNA of drilling and therefore that not uh, synthesize relin. And as you can see here, this fragment is more present 
when the, in the normal ships than the heterozygous ruler. So we think this fragment is dependent of the binding of renin to the, to the receptor. We found this, uh, this fragment in the cerebrospinal uh, fluid of human. And we compared the quantity of this fragment in control and Alzheimer, and it was drastically reduced in Alzheimer samples. Mm, this was this uh, reducement. It was not uh, um, due to the to different amounts of uh, apo, or full length of apoer two because we performed some Western blood and QR, QRT PCR of of apoer two, and it did not reveal uh, differences between Alzheimer and control. Um, we get some samples of this cerebrospinal fluid um, with with, the, with blood. Uh, samples of control uh, cerebrospinal fluid on, and against Alzheimer, and we plotted again different and the, against the amount of the soluble fragment of apoer 2 and only in the cases of control, relin and the soluble fragment correlate very well, and this is it, it, it did not happen in Alzheimer, so this is suggesting that uh, there is a, a, a disruption of, in the in the signaling cascade, and there is not a correct processing of the apoer 2 and finally, we did some experiments in SUSI cells, and um, we treat these cells again with A beta. And as you can see here, uh, the incubation with A beta reduced the amount of this uh, soluble fragment to the media compared to relin. And also, the, we observed that the incubation of relin, sorry, the, the A beta with relin, uh, reduced the internalization of the apoer 2 in the cell. So, making, it's making, um, so this apoer 2 is staying longer in the surface, so maybe this is the mechanism for why it's not being processed. So as conclusion, uh, uh, relin expression is higher in frontal cortex of Alzheimer's disease, but it's signal in pathway is disrupted, maybe because of the interaction with A beta. And the soluble fragment of apoer 2 could be a good indicator of relin signaling. We have time for questions. Okay, uh, you show us that uh, a beta, uh, a beta, mm -hmm. uh, could uh, have an effect on the railing function, and it was clearly indicated that it's a direct interaction between the peptide and uh, mm -hmm. railing. But for the mechanism mainly for the last part of your talk, I wonder, or if you can comment in the fact that there is a competition of the amyloid peptide with the railing for the same cellular receptor. Mm -hmm. If it's a competence or competition, then uh, amyloid will block the railing uh, action on the cleavage of the receptor. Could you tell more about that? Yeah, we have seen a dose-dependent uh, response of relin in these bioinhalation experiments when we were measuring the internalization of, of apoer 2 We observed that um, at lower amount of concentration of A beta, relin uh, is like a relin is able to uh, to bind the apoer 2 receptor and internalize. But as we increase the concentration of A beta, A beta is stronger than relin, you know? and then we have this effect on the longer exposure of the apoer receptor and, and less uh, processing of the apo of the receptor, less secretion of the soluble fragment. Then it's this effect and not the, uh, the competition, the blocking in extracellular. A part mm -hmm. in which in the extracellular in the extracellular way really could bind to the amyloid and prevent the interaction probably of really to the receptor too. I mean that the first step could be also at the extracellular space, I guess. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, in fact, there are some papers that say that in uh, in, in, in normal and healthy cortex, no? they find in old people, relin and Ibita together forming plaques. We have seen that interacts in the media in cells. No? Um, but possibly, yeah, there is a sequestration of Ibita, uh, of relin by Ibita, yeah, inhibiting the effects, the positive effect of relin. Hmm. 
Uh, so do you know the mechanism by which uh, beta amyloid regulates or regulates uh, mRNA levels of realin? Yeah, we are doing some epigenetic uh, studies now. We are checking the methylations, and uh, well, we are now still doing it. No, <laughs> so far it doesn't look like it's methylation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, you check whether it is mediated by the uh, processing of the receptor of APOE to. Uh, yeah, the ICD. Uh, Yes. The, yeah, the endogenous, uh, I mean, there is a small fragment it's called ICD from APOER2. Uh, we published that it's able to, to control the transcription of relin. So, uh, so the defect of beta amyloid on uh, um, we haven't expression done that, yeah. is mediated by this No, we uh, haven't done that. It's this, this in control situation without A beta, yeah. Like we should have. Thank you very much. We move to the last presentation. Asunción Boch Merino will present intracranial AB10 corrects biochemical and histological hallmarks of mucopolysaccharide uh, VII mice and improve bone, bone pathology behavior and survival. Um, good morning. I'd like uh, to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work, which is based on. Um, uh, gene therapy for mucopolysaccharidosis type 7. Uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type 7 is a lysosomal storage disease. It's indeed an ultra-rare lysosomal storage disease due to a deficiency uh, in beta-glucuronidase, uh, which degrades glycosaminoglycans. Um, the main features of the patients with mucopolysaccharidosis type 7 is hepatosplenomegaly, um, delay in the development and uh, very severe skeletal deformities as well neurological impairment, which leads to premature death um, around the age or before the age of 30. This is a progressive disease. Um, in order to look for uh, strategies of gene therapy, what we did in this case uh, was we administered an adeno-associated vector containing the cDNA for the beta-glucuronidase into the lumbar area, into the CSF, through a lumbar intrathecal administration, which is a very uh, poorly invasive technique compared to intraparenchymal or intracerebroventricular administration. The animals were sacrificed and, and analyzed at six weeks or at 16 weeks. And here we had, we analyzed four different groups, the non-treated or treated uh, MPS7 animal models, as well as heterozygous or wild-type animals which uh, have control, normal control, uh, where our controls, they have normal phenotype. When we inject the virus into the CSF, uh, a small portion of the virus goes into the peripheral circulation. And this allows for the infection of other peripheral tissues, such as hepatocytes. Here you can see a section of the liver where we stain it for a, a, a colorimetric enzymatic assay that detects beta-glucuronidase activity. So you could see that we have activity in most of the hepatocytes. And this was enough to uh, normalize the hepatomegaly compared to the non-treated animals to normal levels. This is also a secreted enzyme, and uh, around 10% of the enzyme produce, produced by the transduced cells can be secreted and uptaken to neighboring cells or go to the circulation and uptaken by other cells through the manose-6-phosphate receptor. As you could see here, uh, we also in the treated animals, also in green at short term, in light green or dark green at long term, we could see uh, uh, some uh, levels of beta-glucuronidase activity on the serum and supraphysiological levels of beta-glucuronidase in the liver, in the heart and in the vertebral disc. Those, these two last tissues were analyzed because they are really difficult to transduce and also uh, very difficult to correct. 
a biochemical mark, marker of correction is the analysis of secondary uh, elevated lysosomal en enzymes that, uh, uh, that, that are elevated with, when the, the beta glucuronidase are, are, is missing, like, for example, beta exosaminidase. So, uh, in non treated animals in yellow or orange, um, beta exosaminidase activity is really high. But in the treated animals in green, this is decreased to normal levels in the liver at short and long term, and uh, significantly decrease uh, in these uh, more difficult tissues to transduce. When we look at the histopathology in the liver, for example, we could see this lysosomal enlargement, this, this kind of vacualization um, in most of the cells in the liver here or in the heart that is completely normalized in the treated animals, uh, similar to wild type animals. When we analyze the, 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 the central nervous system, here we could see again the enzymatic activity in the brain. Remember that we injected the virus into the lumbar area, that, so it goes uh, into the CSF and is able to infect um, a high percentage of neurons in the cortex and also in other structures. Um, in the central nervous system. And we analyze the different structures in the brain for beta glucuronidase activity, and in most of the areas, we could detect supraphysiological levels of the enzyme, except in the cerebellum. The biochemical correction is shown here, and you could see that we, we achieve significant reduction at short term and complete correction at long term, um, including the cerebellum. In the spinal cord, we, we detected also transduction in a high percentage of motor neurons and also in interneurons and in the sensory neurons in the dorsal, dorsal root ganglia. And we also saw, uh, and this was seen all along the spinal cord, and we also could achieve supraphysiological levels in, more, in most of the segments that led to uh, biochemical correction in all these areas. Um, we see a lysosome, we can detect the lysosomal distension also by immunohistochemistry using lysosomal markers like LAM1. And you could see that in the non treated animals at short or long term, uh, there is a huge increase of this marker that it's reduced or uh, almost absent, like in the wild type, in the treated animals short and long term in different areas. Here, is, here I show you the cortex or the hippocampus. The histopathology in the central nervous system is also corrected. Here you could find, you see uh, the cytosol of a glial cell that it's completely enlarged due to the glycosaminoglycan accumulation and it's completely normalized uh, in the treated animals, in, here in the cortex, but we also saw most of correction in the cerebellus, except in some a small, um, a, a, some glia that had uh, a, 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 a small vacualization in some cells. Another marker of uh, neurodegeneration is the astrogliosis that, that shows the neuroinflammation of these, uh, these animals. And here is seen by GFAP immunohistochemistry in the cortex of these mice uh, that is higher at six months than at three months and is decreased at three, after six uh, weeks of transduction of treatment and completely normalized after six, uh, 16 weeks. Um, as I told you, these patients have very severe skeletal deformities, and this is very complicated to correct indeed with the uh, enzyme replacement as, uh, assays that are done in, 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 in most of MPS uh, patients with the skeletal deformities. Uh, there's no correction at all. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details, but just look at the figure. Those are uh, three-dimensional reconstructions of micro-CT scans where we could see that in the femur, but we also see it in other uh, bones, like in the vertebra, the number and the thickness of the trabecula uh, in the wild type are much lower. It's dramatically mm, lower than, than in, in, in the 
MPS7 animal. And for the treated animals, we achieve an intermediate condition. Um, we also did a whole battery of behavioral studies. I only will go into two of them, the open field and the Morris water maze. And, and you could see that the non-treated animals in yellow or orange uh, have um, uh, a significant uh, neophobia compared to the, the wild type animals. And the treated animals have an intermediate condition. Um, we also see difference in, so difference in the in the Morris water maze. And the first difference we saw that uh, these animals have an overall physical condition which is much better than the non-treated animals. Uh, if we evaluate the, the speed of uh, in the, the swimming speed of the non-treated animals in yellow is significantly slower than the the, the, the treated animals at three and a half months. And the most important feature that we detected here is that the, the non-treated animals at six months were unable to, to, to swim. They just drowned when they, they were put in the, in the swimming pool. So we couldn't evaluate the, the speed of the, the non-treated animals at six months, but for the, the treated ones, they had exactly the same speed as the wild types. And the cognitive assessment was uh, performed uh, at three and a half months, and we did see significant difference on the treated animals compared to the non-treated at short time, and we couldn't evaluate them at long time. Uh, but what, what we saw is that we, don't, we are not able to reach normal levels at that age on the cognitive uh, assessment. And finally, here is the, evalua the, the evaluation of the survival. This is a very severe model of mucopolysaccharidosis compared to other MPS models that are available. And it has a half-life of 4.2 months. So um, when we analyze the survival curve of the treated animals, we could see that we increase or we more than doubled the half-life of these animals, with some of them uh, reaching the levels of the wild type uh, or heterozygous animals which have the same half-life. So, um, this is an example of a successful uh, treatment that we perform in our lab. We're also working with other animal models of diseases affecting the central nervous system as, and also the peripheral nervous system. And we are open to collaborations with all the groups of the CiberNet network, of, of course. Um, this work was done uh, mainly by Gemma Pages with the help of Lydia Jimenez York on the behavioral behavioral assessment, and Mark Navarro uh, with the skeletal characterization and Katy Casas with the uh, um, CNS uh, transduction, and of course with the um, help of the vector production unit at the Universidad Autónoma of Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I renamed the disease. Uh, questions? I have a, a question. Uh, do you have an amazing results in terms of, uh, of the state of, of the animals? Uh, but you deliver the, the vector through the CSF. Had you tried another uh, vias of administration and do you have any kind of difference in preliminary mm -hmm. experiments? Yeah, in previous um, works, we, we administered the vector into the uh, brain parenchyme. Uh, and, and we achieve also behavioral uh, correction of these animals, but we, the problem is that we can, the vector doesn't go through the systemic circulation, we cannot transduce uh, peripheral tissues. So uh, the, the, the skeletal deformities are, are much severe and, and the, the overall uh, physical condition of the animals is not as good. So we need to transduce all the tissues. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much again. And I want to thank uh, all the presenting authors, uh, not only for the contribution, also for to do all this kind of rapid and short communications in time. And thanks to the crew in order to, uh, because I has been collaborating with the discussion of the, of the poster. Thank you very much.